see people entering the lobby. Oh, that was loud, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it always happened. The voice is always drawing to me when it's when it robotically says that it's improper that the recording's in progress. I go, oh, I got to be careful now. Yeah, I just want to run away and curse. My immediate thing is I'm just like, I need to say the F word immediately. <laughs> uh, you know. That's my, that's my sort of, that's one of my panic instincts as well. And I've been doing some things that are like live TV and like the word fuck is just like screaming in my mind before I start them. I'm like, I'm going to say fuck. It's just going to happen. The cameras are going to start. I'm going to say fuck. And then they're going to, they're going to kick me off and I'm going to just start crying in a ball. But then yeah. it hasn't happened. So I'm relieved. <laughs> I, I was on um, CNN several years ago and it, they were, they were like, we want to talk about, uh, you know, parenting and this and that. And, and I, I had said like, can I say the word vagina? And they were like, no, absolutely not. You cannot. And um, and so the the person that I was asking, the like, you know, pre-screener, I was like, okay, well, can I say Lady Garden? Um, and she was French <laughs> and she was just like, I don't know what that means. I guess so. And so I said Lady Garden on <laughs> CNN. Um, and, and I was like, I just think it's very dismissive when people call me a mommy blogger, because unless you've come out of my lady garden, you shouldn't call me mommy, like call me up, you can call me a parenting blogger or writer. And um, yeah, and you just got, you just saw this look on the, on the host just kind of going like, what just happened? This is why I am such a fan of yours. This, it, this, that energy, that feeling that it's captured in your books, it's captured in your essence. I just appreciate you. <laughs> Oh my gosh i appreciate you right back and looks it looks like we have i think people have oh we still have people coming in looks like it's slowed down though so cool i think people are starting to log in so we can go ahead and begin um i am so happy to be here today when i got uh, an advanced copy of this amazing book that Jeanette uh, wrote. I actually, I got to see the cover before anybody else had. And and um, your, I, I don't know if it was your agent or your publicist, they were like, don't share it, don't share it. We haven't, and I was like, okay, yeah, no worries. And um, and I, I looked at it and I was like, this is either going to be amazing or horrifying. Um, <laughs> and, it, and I read it and I was just like, oh, it's so good. It's so, um, and I get, I get asked to blurb tons of stuff and so usually like one out of every 20 I you know like enough that I'm like oh, I want to put my name on this this is really I, I definitely want to get them encouraged and um so I want to say thank you Jeanette for writing this amazing book and welcome thank you for that fantastic um introduction and also a fun fact that I don't know if, if you're aware of but you were the first person who blurbed my book um, did a blurb for my book. Is that the that's the proper terminology? I'm still learning all the jargon. Okay, did a blurb for my book, and I um, you were at the top of my list, and I was like, God, I know this is such a long shot, but will you just send it just in case? Uh, and I, I sent that to my my literary agent and to my publisher, and then when they came back and said that you sent one in, I it made my week. I was dancing, I was screaming. It was like, I, I was I was in New York City when I found out and I was just so filled with joy and um, probably annoying everybody that passed me on the streets. Cause I was like, I had such a pep in my step. It was uh, wild. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. Um, so so I have a lot of, of questions and I know that um, a lot of the, the people who were gonna be hearing this, a lot of them, haven't gotten the book yet. In fact, I think it, quite a few people because it has sold so well. Your first run, uh, your first printing is completely sold out, which is amazing. Um, and so, uh, so I know that there are probably a lot of people who haven't haven't gotten the book and have maybe heard little tidbits and everything. So, so we're going to hit on some stuff um, and maybe not so much on some other things. So there still be surprises uh, yeah. and. Let's see, so I need, okay, so first a little bit of housekeeping. If you do have questions, if we have time to get to them, um, there's a little thing down at the bottom that says Q&A. Um, feel free to leave if you have some, some questions uh, and we can get to them, then we may uh, share them. But I'm gonna start first with, what inspired you to share your, your story, to write this book? Mm. Um, well, I had done, I had done a lot of therapy before going anywhere near writing about this creatively, which I think was important. 
um, because any sort of, for me, like premature exploration of anything that's informed by my personal life or is in this case about my personal life, I just, I, I need those boundaries for myself. Boundaries were a thing that I didn't have when I was little, that I didn't know what they were. And so once I learned them, I wanted them and I wanted a lot of them. So for me, it was a matter of really exploring everything personally and finding that perspective that for me, I can only get with time. Um, I, it's not something that can be rushed and uh, it took a lot of time and a lot of therapy and a lot of, a lot of work um, before I was able to kind of explore it creatively. But then once I, I did, start writing the book, the thing that, that motivated me was really just, which I'm sure you can relate to this, but the, that feeling where it just has to come out. It's like, it needs to be birthed. It, it's demanding it. It's pushing up on you so hard that it's like, okay, I hear you. I can't think about anything else until I get this out. It's going to come and it's going to happen. And I just have to let it happen and sort of be the, the, the vessel for it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it's interesting um, that you uh, brought up boundaries right in the front, because that was one of my first questions um, was, were you, were you able to set boundaries of this is what I want to share, this is what I don't, or were you just like, let's lay it all on the table? Um, and, and not only that, but did other people sort of inform what you shared and what you didn't? nobody the person who was closest to the material in 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 the thick of the material with me was my editor Sean Manning who was incredible and the really the strongest champion from the beginning of just my voice which was amazing because I spent many years with my voice not being really validated in any way or or listened to and trying to send people things and nobody reading like it was just it's just a lot of rejection so to have Sean um, like the proposal and then and then be in the trenches with me from the beginning was was very, very, very helpful, but he never. Um, you know orchestrated what was left in or what was left out he really left that up to me and I appreciate that. Um, and 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 boundaries did play a factor, you know I did go to therapy uh, throughout the process of writing the book just to make sure that I did honor the the things that I wanted to just keep for myself. And also I, I really wanted the book to be entertaining and I didn't want to just, uh, you know, there's no point in oversharing, I don't think. And I think knowing, well, what in my life is entertaining versus what is just for me and what's not entertaining. There's also a process to that and to, to make sure that I'm not just wasting people's time with, with sort of some overindulgent, like, you know, long-winded thing about, I don't know, whatever, whatever the therapy session that day had been. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't think it, it is in any way possible for it, for this to be long winded because it almost felt like every chapter I would be like, oh, my God. And then and then then another chapter would happen. And I'd be like, oh, this is something totally different. What? And then another chat and I'd be like, Jesus. What? And, and sometimes sometimes because it was so funny and sometimes because it was like horrifying and sometimes because it was sad. But every single time I thought okay, take a breath. And then I would get to the next chapter. I'd be like, oh my God, how <laughs> she has so much material. Like, she, like there's so much that she has gone through and so much um, that you, that you shared. Uh, one of the things that I was really impressed with is, you know, so much of this material is um, it's, uh, it's dark, you know, it, it gets into some really hard topics, but you handle it not only with grace, but also um, with humor. Um, and it, it's weird to, like, even when I was blurbing it, I was like, I, I hate to say this is really a funny book because I don't want people to be like, oh yeah, it's isn't it great when parents, you know, abuse their children? That's so funny, you know? But I was like, but your writing is so wry and, and just beautifully done where we're, we're on the journey with you. Um, how, how did you handle that, adding the humor to it? Or does that just come naturally? Hmm. I, um, I, I think a lot of humor comes from naivete. And so the, it's the, the book, um, I think this is fun about reading it. So I hope this isn't spoiling it for people, but it's the point of view of me at whatever age I'm, um, I'm writing about. So it's me at six or 14 or 20. Um, and I think that, that, that point of view of a kid, especially with the chaotic situations and environments I was in and, and, and oftentimes traumatic, uh, environments that I was in, to me, it needs some levity. It's just too, I think it would just be too heavy if it's me like waxing poetic about back when I was six, you know, from my point of view now. 
Um, whereas somebody's at my door and I don't know who that is. Sorry. Uh -oh. just scared to knock. I'm scared. <laughs> just hide. That's what I do. I'm just like, I'm not home. I just stay really still and I pretend I'm a mannequin. <laughs> me too, but all my windows are open. They can't see me from this angle, but I'm sure they can hear me. <laughs> Um, but so, so, so to me, I think, I think that, sh um, those traumatic kind of environments need some levity. And, and I think the, the best, the best way that I know how to do that or bring that into the, into the storytelling is through the, that naive point of view of a child who's just like, cool, the boys are playing Nintendo and mom's chasing dad with a knife and this is normal. And this is a Tuesday. Like that simplicity is, is I think funny. Yeah. Yes, it, it, it absolutely is. And it, it also really made me feel like I was, I was there in the situation, um, which in, in some ways I think was, is wonderful. And in some ways I just kind of wanted to like grab you and go like, let's take you away from here. Um, especially because, and, and I think a lot of people kind of miss this. Um, you know, I've seen like, you've gotten a lot of publicity from, for this book, which you absolutely should, because it's a great book, but so much of it is, more of like the the Hollywood stuff and the you know the the kind of you know shock stuff and the um the glitzy glamour and how it's not glitzy glamour and, and that's all important but what I really loved was how often um I would relate to all of the things that you were talking about whether it be um abuse or um eating disorders uh when one of the things that I, I really loved is that you shared these very specific moments, um, including uh, one of them where you had uh, thrown uh, food in the garbage and then you'd sprayed perfume on it in order to not eat it. And then you still, you know, got it out and you ate it. And, um, and you know, I had dealt with eating disorders and I, I don't ever have perfume, but I absolutely, you know, threw it in the garbage and like put ketchup on it and then later would open up the garbage and, and yep. eat out of it. And, and there was something, um, there's just something so horrifying in that so many of us deal with it, but also so wonderful about the fact that we can say, oh, that terrible moment, we're not alone in that. So I just want to say thank you for that. Oh my God, no, thank you, thank you for for mentioning that um, that piece of the book because I that is that was something that brought me so much shame for so long, and something that I remember even when I was initially seeing an eating disorder specialist and and trying to work on those issues, um, that was something that I had a really hard time saying to to him to the person helping me because it was just. It was just so um, humiliating, um, and and my hope definitely with with talking about eating disorders is, is um, I guess bluntly as I as I try to is that I think there's so much shame there, and I just I think the only way to kind of help that shame and 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 bring a new shade to it is through talking openly about this stuff because there are to your point yeah a lot more of us I think who experience that than we even realize and and hopefully in the connection there's some solace. Absolutely. Um, so you also talk about um, your OCD, which sort of um, showed up when you were young as the voice of Jesus Christ, as it does for all of us. Uh, <laughs> and and it and and it I loved I loved the way that you explored it uh, because I have my own voice and I've dealt with my own. And never I because I'm not religious, it never occurred to me that that you know. Instead, I go to like that is the voice of a guardian angel who's telling me that I need to do this. I have to like ask the cats for good luck before I leave or else something bad's going to happen to my family. And the, um, yes. do you, do you think that with, um, you know, eating disorders and OCD and all of that, does it, what does that go back to? Is it, a, is it control? Is it, or do you think they're related? For me, I think, I think they're definitely related and I absolutely think it goes back to control. I think that my surroundings were so uncertain and chaotic and dysfunctional. And I think I was a little girl desperate for control and the octopus arms went out and found whatever they could, which for me was eating disorders and OCD. Um, and, and, um, and that's, that was absolutely, I think the kind of birthplace of, of all that for me. What about you? Do you feel do you feel that it's control or was it some, did it have a different 
foundational piece for you? It was absolutely control. It was anxiety and it was the fact that I can't control anything else in my life, but I can control that I will only eat a thousand calories and that I will weigh myself and that I will be in charge of this. And, and I can't control the world, but if the voice tells me that I need to do this certain thing and avoid this certain number, then I'm listening to the voice. And if something goes wrong, it's the voice's fault. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so so one of um, one of the things that you share is your your relationship with your mother, which you know was so complex uh, and you know the hard hard to read in that you know it was such extreme abuse, but also so easy to not see as abuse as a child to to not see, oh, this is actually not okay. Um, and I was wondering, so do you feel like this is going to be more helpful to people dealing with a situation like that with toxic family or more people to, or, or more for people who are maybe the toxic people in their relationship who may recognize themselves and say, mm -hmm. oh, that's not okay. That's such an interesting thoughtful question. I, I have um, been approached quite a bit um, this this past week since the books come out and, and the, the, the things that people uh, and meeting people at signings and, and what have you, but the things that people have been saying is, oh, I get a lot of my mom's still alive. I can't say this. Thank you for saying this. Or you've inspired me to set a boundary. I a, a girl the other day was crying and was like, I'm calling my mom after this. I'm, I'm telling her blank, blank, blank. I just finished the book. I really know that what I need to do now. And that's been amazing. I will say not once has somebody come up to me and been like, I'm, I'm the toxic one and I got to change. I wish that was the case, <laughs> but I have a feeling those toxic ones might just walk right past the book and onto, you know, onto the book called, Hey, I'm great or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. That's going to be my next book. Hey, I'm great. <laughs> what a title. What a ti and then it just opens up and it just goes, no, you're not. Did you think you were? You made a mistake. You're <laughs> the wrong place. Uh -huh. Well, you know, uh, for for me, there were there were lots of times when, as I was reading it, um, I I would stop and you know because you know uh, my kid is you know about to turn eighteen and they're starting to go out in the world and I'm like seeing like okay, well th this is they're they're a person and they're you know unique and their personalities is done and and now as as a, a mom this is sort of the point where you kind of look back and go did I do it right like did I don't know I don't know and and honestly um I I told Haley I was like I told them that they need to they should read the book because I think it's really good at um giving permission to talk about the things that aren't perfect and that I mean really if you really want to be a good person you should be able to hear somebody say I wish you hadn't handled this this way or you know this thing really bothered me and it still really bothers me and I'd like you to say I'm sorry or you know explain it or let's um so I I think there probably are a lot of conversations that are happening because of this book that maybe you just don't hear so much about mm, I'm 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 really hopeful of that I I felt like, and this was sort of something that was, um, a, a, I guess a mission statement kind of thing, like while I was writing or just something that I tried to keep close to my chest of, um, if it was really uncomfortable to say, I felt it was probably more important to put down, like the more uncomfortable it felt to say, the more important I felt like it was to write it. Um, just cause I do think it's really, it's, it's really easy to be comfortable. And, and that's why, you know, that's, that's why it happens, but um, I've lost my train of thought and we've gone <laughs> going off the rails here. <laughs> I, I literally forgot to take my ADD meds and then I thought, oh, I should take them. And then I thought, wait, have I already taken them? And so I didn't take them. And so <laughs> several times I have been like, where am I? What did I ask that question? Can't remember. Um, you so actually talk this like you, you talk like you write and it's making my heart explode. <laughs> 
it's ridiculous. It's, it's so ridiculous. I literally, I uh, reached out to my doctor and I was like, I can't go pick up my ADD meds and I've forgotten to take them for a week. And they say that they won't fill them because I waited too long. And she was like, yeah, that's okay. Well, I guess that's proof that you need them. Yeah, that's, don't, why, why do things, do, and I was like, I can't because I ran out of them and now I don't think right. And, I, and then she's like, what's, okay. <laughs> uh let's see so I, oh, I had a question on what you were just saying and yeah I've completely forgotten what it was uh but that's okay because we'll we'll move forward because I have lots of other ones um so one of one of the things that I, I actually wrote it down because as soon as I read it I was like ow my heart um, there's there's a moment fairly early in the book when um, your mom says, uh, you know, things seem like they're going the right way, but really just kind of for your mom and what what your mom wants. Um, and she asks, why aren't you happier? Everyone wants what you have. Uh, and I think that is such a profound uh, sentence because I think the average person probably would look and go like, oh my gosh, you know, they're, they're famous and they're beautiful and they, you know, she's got, she's got it all, you know, in the palm of her hands. And, um, and, and at no point really were you living your own sort of life or, you know, truly happy. I, I loved the, um, the way of touching on uh, the fact that some things make certain people happy and some things make other people happy and it's okay to say that's your dream not my dream mm. do, you, do you feel like you have gotten to that point or do you still feel like you still struggle with that in some ways no no I um I I appreciate this one also because I do it was such a difficult path for me. I felt like I, you know, at, at 21, which is when my mom died, I was in a career that I'd been in since I was six that my mom put me in that really just defined me. Like nobody knew me, they knew my character. Um, and so I, I, I have a lot of social anxiety. It's gotten much better now, but going outside and then being recognized by people, it was just like, everything felt like chaos, you know, whether I was on set or leaving the house or in the house with my mom, like, everything just felt like a 10 all the time of intensity. Um, and then, you know, after my mom died and then, you know, I go over all this in the book and there's a whole, there's a whole arc there, but eventually I find therapy and I, and I, and I, I started working on um, figuring out my values. And it was such a basic, it's such a basic thing. Like, it sounds so basic. It sounds like, well, everyone knows what their values are, right? Like they just have them. It's just whatever you inherently are or what you feel like is most true to yourself. I hadn't considered it before then. I had I had only considered what my mom wanted for me. I had literally never asked myself the question, "What are your values? What do you live by?" And that was such a um, such a simple tool, but something I took very seriously. My therapist had given me like um, a sheet of like three hundred potential values and told me to really sit with them for for a week between our between our sessions and figure out what my values were. That was the 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 simplest, but but first and foremost, I think little activity that helped me to kind of touch base with myself and feel like I could even have hope that I could live a life that was more aligned with what I wanted. And then of course came kind of the bigger decisions of like walking away from acting, which felt, you know, I, I get that that can seem a bit like rebellious or defiant or something. And, and I think it needed to be for me at the time. I think I had never stuck a flag in the ground and said like, this is where I stand. And that to walking away from acting and saying, I'm not doing this felt like Felt like that for me it felt like me going that's not me that's what mom wanted you know kind of a bit of like a fuck that i'm gonna just do what try, try to figure out what me is. i'm gonna do me but first i gotta figure out what me is um and that process was um and is you know but much less so now it was it was, it was bumpy it was complicated it was riddled with self-doubt i constantly was second guessing should i have left acting should i have not was this the right choice should i have just done the thing that everybody wanted me to do and um and you know and 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 also the other piece that really got me through was writing i i had always wanted to write and my mom had never supported it she had always said her her favorite go-to line was i want you you know actresses have cute little peach butts and writers get big giant watermelon butts and not i don't want you to have a watermelon butt net um 
And so I always thought, well, I can't do that because mom wants me to act instead. But eventually, you know, walking away from acting, working on the values and then committing myself to writing felt like I had some foundation there that I really needed. Um, but then a ton of self-doubt every day along the way. I'm not sure you can be a good writer or at least like essay memoirist if you don't have a ton of self-doubt because otherwise nobody wants to read it. Nobody wants to read like, I've got it all figured out and here's how it came to be naturally. Nobody wants that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I, I, I love that, um, that idea of the values. Um, I, I have struggled with, I still struggle with that. Really? Yeah, because I have, um, I get offered lots of opportunities that I think the average person would be like, oh my gosh, like you can travel the country and they, you know, people want you to come and speak and they want you to, and all of these things that, it, that I, like a normal, a neurotypical person would be like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. I can't wait. That's so exciting. And instead, all I can think is that sounds awful. That is not what I want to do. And then I turn it down and then I feel worse because I'm like, Oh, I've turned down this opportunity that everybody else would be like, why did you turn that down that, you know, um, it's hard. It's hard to, 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 um, it's hard to find those values and stick with those values. But I think it's harder to, uh, live by the values that you think other people have, or that you should have, like oh. it just feels wrong. Yes. Oh my God. It just feels wrong. That's so well said. There's something in the gut. I remember I would force myself to try to want those things. I would force myself to try to do the path that people were telling me and that it was being really externally reinforced. You know, it's like I could whatever, just it, the, 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 the environments around me were really reinforcing a certain version of myself that I just felt like I, there's just it just doesn't feel like me. It just doesn't feel truthful to me. Um, I hate to put you on the spot, but do what are you? Can you share some of your values? Are you able to are you willing to share some of your values? Um, I think the the biggest value um, that I have is um, being happy, which doesn't seem like a value, but the way that I look at it is um, I'm not going to be happy until the people that I love are happy. And mm. so it helps me to kind of go, okay, well, you know, maybe I turn this down or turn that down. But in the end, my family doesn't really care so much about that. They just want me to be okay. They want me to be safe and, and healthy. Um, so, you know, very often I will go and say there, there's actually, a, this sounds so dumb, but there's a question that I ask myself every morning, which is, um, what healthy thing can I do for myself today? Hmm. And there's something really lovely about that because some, and it's not like go run a 5k cause that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it's uh, sometimes what lovely thing can you do is, uh, you need to go take a nap. You need to take the rest of the day off. You need mm -hmm. to go you know, meet a friend and, you know, split a margarita, you need to like do whatever it is um, that you need to do and not judge uh, by, by other, other people's um, ideas. I, I still, I, I don't know that I will ever not struggle with it, um, but it's getting easier. It's getting easier for me to say, oh, this thing um, like I spent it like two days in Scotland years ago and it was so hard to do but I was with my family and I got through it and I did and so I I look at it and I'm like that's it that's that was the moment like hiking on a mountain in the middle of nowhere those are the moments that the that I love and the things where other people might look and go like oh but what about a fancy car and go here and then I'm just like no I don't no, it doesn't, it doesn't speak to me. So finding those things that speak to you and realizing that they have value, even though they don't have Instagram value or they don't have headline value. Yes. Oh, oh my God, 100%. It makes such a difference. Uh, so one of the things that, and it, and it was so interesting because as I was reading it, I was sort of re-examining my own life. Um, you talk about being a good sport and about how, you know, you were tired of it. You're like, I'm done being a good sport. I'm going to do things for myself, which is so amazing. Um, but so often when you would talk about it, particularly um, when you were younger and people would take advantage of you, um, in particular men. And I, so I, I would read it and I would be like, oh my gosh, this, this older man and she's a teenager. And then I was like, 
oh, like the second person I ever kissed was like 38 and I was 15. And I'm like, oh, that was fucked up. Oh my God. And, and I think at the time I was like, this is wrong. But now I look at it and I'm like, oh, I totally was just like, I need to be a good sport. I need to go along with this. Hmm. Um, and I love that you, you talked about that and you examined it and all of these things that we, um, that we don't realize in the time are not okay. Um, I just thought, I, I'm not sure where my question went there, uh, but I, I just, it felt so comforting to know that I was not alone and that it was okay to go back and look at those moments. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm so glad you say this. And, and I do f- hope, I think there's a, an important conversation to be had around the narrative of being a good sport. Um, because I do think that so often that's, hey, you're a good sport is code for, hey, you're being really mistreated and tolerating it. And it's, it's like, I just want anybody who hears that they're a good sport regularly to consider their circumstances and to be their own biggest advocate. Like I feel so passionately about this. Um, I just really, really, I know the people who are good sports. I know the instinct to be a people pleaser. I know they're just trying to make things easy for everybody around them. And I know all of that. Um, But I think those are the people who most deserve to really stand up for themselves and find their voice and speak up to the very likely mistreatment that's happening to them. Exactly. Um, Let's see. One of the things that you write about is the work of recovery, of of therapy. And um, I loved that you were one of the first things that you share with one of your therapists, um, Laura, didn't quite go in uh, in the perfect sort of way. So could you share a little bit about that? Yes, um, the the first therapist that I that I went to, um, her name was Laura. She was sort of a therapist slash life coach slash probably some other things. She was a multi hyphenate, a talented lady, um, and I I I initially was sharing with her about she was working with me on eating disorders and also trying to kind of excavate some of my past, and so I I shared with her some stories of my relationship with my mom. And I I was doing this thing where I disclaim everything because I could almost read her face, even though, you know, she's a therapist and she's somewhat unreadable, but I was a child actor, so very kind of wired to read even the most unreadable of people. And so I'd be saying these things about my relationship with my mom, but I'd preface everything because I could feel her sort of judging or tracking it a certain way. So I'd say, well, my mom did this, but she completely meant well because my mom was my best friend. My mom only had my best interest at heart. Or I know this sounds a certain way, but my mom, like everything was just excessively defending her and protecting her and protecting the narrative that as I see it now, I needed for my own survival. I needed to have my mom on that pedestal. Um, Eventually after enough stories, she goes, Jeanette, you know, what you're talking about is abuse. Like this is, this is abuse. It was the first time I had heard that, um, you know, that word in the same sentence with my mom, and I couldn't handle it. So I quit therapy. I literally went home that day and I said, Hey, I'm not, I'm, I'm good. I'm not going to do this anymore. Thank you for your time, but I'm, I'm good on therapy. And it took me a while to go back to it because I was really overwhelmed by the daunting work that, that I knew would be ahead of me. If I accepted that my mother was abusive, like that would mean my whole life had been oriented to the narrative that my mom wanted what was best for me, that my mom knew everything and I knew nothing, that my mom was all powerful and I was incompetent, that I would be nothing without her. The idea that none of those things were true and that my mom was actually abusive and manipulative and narcissistic, that would mean not only reframing my world, but also trying to confront my identity, which is a thing I didn't have since my whole identity had been oriented around my mom. Um, but eventually I did go, I did find a new therapist. That was, that worked, it worked out. Spoiler, it worked out. <laughs> yeah, it did. It worked out and it worked out beautifully. Um, and, and I love that. I think um, a maybe a less authentic person would have just started with the therapy that, you know, was super successful. Uh, but that is not usually the way the therapy goes, you know, and, and not just because you know, sometimes you're not ready for it. And sometimes it's a slow thing, or sometimes you have like a really shitty therapist, or sometimes you have a great therapist, but they're not the right therapist for the you that exists at that time. Oh, so well said. Yes. 
So yeah, so I, I love I love that. I love that you get to see that journey of like, because I, I started to see it and I was like, oh, she's doing so well. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh shit, oh no. And, and I was like, Right? but that's but that's real that's that is reality like it's it, therapy is just like real life like sometimes it works really well and sometimes it really doesn't and I mean we're human therapists are human we change constantly um yeah. it, it always bums me out I've had a few friends who've tried therapy and they'll they'll see one and then they'll still be like nah, I just wasn't a good fit and I'm like no I'm off to the side just like but then trying not to be controlling because I know that I can be controlling so I'm like don't say anything don't say anything but all I want to say is try as many as you need to until you find a therapist that fits that suits you that clicks exactly exactly yeah I mean I I honestly I don't know that it's possible to the first time click with somebody and be like this is the person I'm going to stay with forever um and and you know you change just like you know you're you change you change your therapist you change your you know whatever it is that you're doing so yeah Love it. So I love how you um, you talk so much about the the work of recovery. Um, so what was so this this could go either way, um, whichever way you want to answer it. Either what was the hardest part of the book to write, or what was your favorite part of the book to write? Ooh, I I immediately was like hardest part. What does that say about me? <laughs> Same. Tough. I get it. Okay, I'm, I'm glad. Kindred spirits. Um, the, the thing that came to me last was, um, I won't spoil this for anyone, but uh, since you know Jenny, but the uh, showering, um, there's a chapter that has something to do with, or a vignette that has something to do with, with showering, and that one was, um, I don't do a lot of outlining. Do, are you an out, do you enjoy outlining? Do you do outlining? No, I can't, no. It's me neither. Consciousness. Yep, nope, just as me it comes too. to me. Yes, oh my god, I'm so relieved. I always feel like a little guilty that I don't like outlining, but this makes me very happy. I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't I didn't do any outlining. I think I scared the shit out of my editor when I sent him a 14 page like blur of a brainstorm. He was like, I'm just curious, like what your early kind of I had sent him the proposal at this point. He had read that, which had two vignettes in it. Um, but then he had asked me to share some of my brainstorming and I was like, here goes. And I just sent him 14 pages of the most jumbled up, like three words of what I wanted vignettes to be. And then in all like it was a mess. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he was terrified, but he hid it well. And in the, I would, I would, yeah, I would, I would have like the broad strokes of what I wanted a vignette to be. So like, oh, mom, mom, kind of, te mom teaching me anorexia was like the name of one vignette that I knew I wanted to have. Or, um, you know, first kiss on set would be maybe the name of another another vignette that I wanted to have. And I had like showering, and I and I knew that I wanted to have a vignette about this showering experience of mine. But I got through several drafts before I was even able to write, I mean, many, I think I did probably 12 drafts total, six that were turned into the publisher, six or seven that were turned to the publisher. And it was probably my fifth draft turned into them by the time that I, this, this vignette came out and it was, it just did not want to come out. I didn't want to go near it. Now I see it, I think as avoidance. I was just, it was, it was, it was tough. I didn't know how to tackle it. I didn't want it to be too heavy. I wanted it to be the right length of time. I didn't want it to, I just had a lot of, um, a lot of wants around it. And I, and I, you know, it didn't come it didn't come quickly but then when it did come it it came in one sort of session and it was uh I, I i was i was glad that it came out eventually but it was the very last thing and i think i think the hardest because of the avoidance element to it i always compare um when there's something that i have to write and i i can't write it it uh, it uh, I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's like childbirth. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's like constipation and you are dying. And you just like, uh, like all you want to do is poop and you can't. And it goes yes. on carrying it around, but it's your yes. head constipated. And you're like, I have to get it out so that I can get it out of my brain because I don't want it in there anymore. Oh my God. And you can't focus on anything else. And you're like, I know that I'm not super present. You're at a dinner with family and you're like, I'm trying to be here, but I'm not really here. And I wish I was there, but I can't be there because it's not fucking coming out. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, I think you did it. I think you did it beautifully in that it was, um, it was very simple and it was very, here's exactly what happened. And instead of um, telling the reader how awful it is you let the reader sort of experience it on their own and be like oh that's awful that's um and and there's something really kind of of wonderful about that type of um 
honesty and authenticity. Um, I very much uh, enjoyed the uh, the observational uh, work that you did in the book, and I think it's really it's really interesting that um, one of the things that you had written is I don't like to be observed. I like to do the observing, and that's what writing is all about. Mm. Uh, so yeah, as soon as soon as I read that part, I was like, okay, she's found she's found the right thing. Do you feel like writing is the right thing? I do. It's it's funny you say that because this kind of this reminds me of the experience of you know I I get how how whiny it sounds to be like oh I I you know fame was really hard for me like boo hoo wah fame I get it um and I and I talk about how whiny it sounds also in the book but it it was like my my personality seemed like from a very early age like I wanted to just kind of if I could just be a fly on the wall not really talk to anybody in the room and just observe what was happening that was what I wanted to be doing I found that interesting I found that I I never felt like I knew how to do you know the just like group conversations I can do one-on-one -on -one conversations great I love that but like group conversations I just feel like there's some the ball's in the air and I don't know who's catching it next, but it's not going to be me and I don't want to get it and at some point I'm going to get it and I'm living in fear of getting the ball at any point like I hate it. Um, I'd rather be just off to the side observing and and when you're in the public eye you, you don't have the luxury of observing, you know, and. Uh, and, and, and so it was really difficult to just sort of be like I feel like I lost that part of, I lost access to that part of me for for a few years where I just couldn't observe the way that I did when I was little. Um, because I was so at the just in in the state of sort of doing the like signings of things and take pictures of things and that's a very very different that's being observed you know it's it's not observing but I do such a long-winded answer but I do feel like writing is 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 the thing and it, it always has been my way of um, processing my life my world it feels like the way that I can make sense of things the way that I can see myself you know I feel like sometimes Tell me if you relate to this. Like, I, I'm I I wish I were more articulate when I spoke. Sometimes I'll be like, God, I I can't like get it out. I'm like I can't get it out. But if I can type it out, I can get it out. Well, one hundred percent. Oh uh, my god, over over and over. In fact, if I do interviews, any interview that I do, I'm like, can you email it to me because yes. it's not going to sound good otherwise. Yes, 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 yes. Yep. <laughs> exactly the same. And it's so funny. Um, what you were talking about, because when I, like, I don't go out very often, but usually when I do, it's, um, you know, with Victor and he's, you know, he has like his friends or work people. And anytime that there's more than two people there, I just kind of zone out and I'm just watching and I, I'm watching, but I'm not in, in any way involved. And Victor will be like, hi, you want to be part of the conversation? And I was, and I'll be like, I forgot I wasn't watching TV. Like y'all were a TV show that I started watching. And I'm really sorry. And Haley, not too long ago, um, was talking about, they were like, you know, I don't really like parties. I, you know, I know that teenagers are supposed to like parties, but I don't really like them. They're loud and they're like, I just don't like them. And I was like, I totally get it. I didn't like them either. But I will say there is something wonderful about when you find somebody to party and they get whatever it is, what you're like, you know, hey, have you heard about the torso they found upstairs? Or And they're like, oh, I love torso murders. And then you go and you find a bathroom and you lock the door and then you have like a two hour conversation with that one person. That's the best. I feel like if we were at a party, you would be that person for me. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I'm oh, all about the torsos. <laughs> Right. All about torsos. I'm gonna put that on, on a shirt. That's gonna be our new club. All you about the torsos. One of us can write hi, I'm great, and the other can write all about the torsos. <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. It's perfect. Uh let's see. So dun, dun, dun. I've got oh okay. I, I, I've actually asked a lot of these. I don't do in any order whatsoever. So now I'm like, wait, what about this one? Nope, didn't do that one. Um, let's see. Okay, we talked about writing. Are you a reader? Um, I wasn't for a while and I've recently gotten very deep into it. Isn't it odd to like for writing to be the form of processing and also like, yeah, but I'm not a huge reader. It's, it's yeah. it seems so bizarre, but I was, I was a very big reader when I was little um, and then lost it probably in adolescence and then got back into it when I was like uh, maybe 19. It, it just comes in waves. Um, yeah. I just read, I'm late on this one, but I just read three women 
Oh, I haven't read it. Is it good? Oh my God. Oh, it's so, it's so good. It's, it's uh, Lisa Tadeo or T-A-D-D-E-O. And it is about, um, she lived with three women for, for seven years and, and talk about fly on the wall. She was just exploring them and their experience. And it's about women and lust and want and desire and, and the feeling of want specifically from a woman's point of view. Um, and I just found it fascinating and enthralling and I, I, I'm obsessed with it. It's so, so, so good. Okay. I'm immediately adding it to my list as soon as I get finished with the book that I am working on. Perfect. Okay. What's the book? Um, well, I can't say it because I think I might end up picking it for my oh. book club. And if Got I it. see it and people are like, oh, that sounds great. And then they buy it. And then later they're like, I already bought this. Why did you pick it for the book club? And so, so I can't actually say it out loud. Um, are you, I imagine you're a big reader. Oh my gosh, I am. I probably, I haven't, for the last couple of weeks I haven't read because I had like a little a bit of a depression and when oh. I'm like not mentally well, it's, it, I can't keep the paragraph in my head, mm. but now I'm coming back out. So I try to read um, maybe four books a week. Wow. Oh my Lord. Wow. Yeah. But I'm also a speed reader. Like I, I, I'm very much a, where I'm like, okay, here's this plot. Here's this. And every once in a while, I'll get a book where the prose is so beautiful that I have to read it in real time, like a normal mm -hmm. person. Um, and I'm always like, okay, this is a sign of a good book, but also I've got shit to do. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fine. What do you have any uh, recommendations? I'd love any that you, you might have. Let's see. Um, one of my favorite with prose was uh, Priest Daddy, I think was really, really good. Yeah. Uh, the, the book that we're reading right now in our in the Fantastic Strange Things book club is uh, The Book Eater, which is really good. It's sort of like a vampire book, but instead of eating blood, it's more like they eat stories. Oh. And it, it's such a great, it's very dark, um, but like a lovely thing about the complexities of motherhood and wow. making the wrong decision and how do you protect your child and when is it too much and it's hmm. I really I really like that so that's a interesting I will I will get both of these I'll read both very good very good um let's see so we do have quite a few great we only have a few minutes left but we have some really great questions I want to pull a couple of them out let's see okay so what was it like doing the audiobook uh reading you narrated it yourself right I did I did what was um, that? I had my I have a lot of stuffed animals I have one right here this is not the stuffed animal I had with me in my lap but I did take a stuffed animal with me in my lap um because I wanted to feel really safe and um and also kind of I'm writing a lot about you know from the point of view of me as a kid and stuffed animals were something that did make me feel really safe as a kid so I wanted that to be close with me my stuffed animal meatball accompanied me um, and it was, it was a really good experience. I, I definitely got, you know, felt emotional at the end of the days, felt drained at the end of the days, but, um, and I was really nervous going into it, but then I felt, I felt totally kind of like it clicked once I, once I was in there. You have a specific, uh, you, I'm forgetting where, I think it was in one of your books that you talk about the experience of recording is that right yes yeah where i had a panic attack and i couldn't do it and they were like we're going to replace you <laughs> yeah and i reached out to to neil gaiman and i was like i know you know how to do this i'm about to get fired from writing my reading my own book how do i do this and he was like pretend you're good at it and so i was like okay and so i went in and i pretended to be someone who could do it and got through four sentences in a row, which was a big improvement. And uh, yeah, and they were like, what did what did you just do when you went to the bathroom? And I was like, I just, I did a lot of cocaine. Uh, and they were going, and I was like, no, not really. I just, I got some good advice. Uh, and, and, but I, but still to this day, every single time when I go out on a stage or I perform, I write, pretend you're good at it on my body every single time, because it's, there's something about that ritual that's very, comforting and reminds me that I am probably good at it mm. uh, so yeah I love that your your voice is so it's so melodic and like and 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 fun to listen to the way that I couldn't imagine if somebody else did it that'd be a huge uh disappointment <laughs> Wait, when I did my first book that was not common for for the um 
for the narrator, even if it was an essay that was, they were just kind of like, so we'll have somebody, like I really had to push for it, which I was surprised. Yeah. Um, but it's funny now because there are all these people who are like, I love to listen to your audiobooks because your your voice it, it's very you don't pause you you know everything's this weird run on sentence but it's very comforting and I have a lot of people who are like every single night I turn on your audiobook and go to sleep and so I don't know if that's a compliment or not but it is nice that I'm sleeping with all these people at least I'm getting out a little bit. <laughs> Oh, no, I mean, it sounds it's it sounds it sounds to me like I, I've I've listened and read and, and and when I listen it sounds to me like you are, um, like you're talking like you normally talk and it's such a pet peeve of mine. Oh my fucking god! When you get to the audiobook and they're like, so then I walk down the street. It's like why is this the slowest thing I've ever heard? Oh my god! Exactly. <laughs> oh my god! I'm a hundred percent. That's why every time I listen to podcasts, I always listen to it at like one and a quarter or one and a half. Although I will say I don't on yours. Yours are like the regular <laughs> speed. I'm like, oh, okay. Look, I can listen to this. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Oh my gosh. There's a lot of great questions here. Uh, and lots of people just saying like, giving you so much, so much hugs and people who've gone, you know, to no contact. Uh, Let's see, what do you think that your relationship would be like if you had one um, with your mom now, if she was still alive? Ooh, if she was still alive, well, I certainly wouldn't be able to write. Um, I think I'd, I, I do think I'd still be acting. Um, I think I feel very strongly that I would still have probably multiple eating disorders. Um, I think, I, it's, it makes me sad to think about. I think my life would look completely different. And I think I, I wouldn't have been, if, we, if she were still alive, just knowing where I was at with her, I don't think I would have been able to claw my way out. I think it, it literally took her death to find myself. I don't think, I don't think I would have been able to do it if she were alive. Yeah. What is, this is such a great question. Um, what does your ideal future look like for you? Mm. I'd love to keep writing. I'm working on a novel now. I <gasps> am really enjoying that. Any I want to read it. Advice? I want to read it. Bring it. <laughs> Any suggestions, tips, pointers? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I am also working on a novel. I have been working on it for seven years. It's literally oh all the stuff that's up here. It will this? never get finished. Okay. The, it's this like, wait, hang on a second. Yeah. Um, it's so ridiculous. It's just these, just where I'm like, oh, well, maybe this happens and then maybe that happens. And I love that the one fluttered off the top, that little guy. Exactly. Like, that's going to eat that. And I'm going to be like, what happened with that? I don't know. That character died, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I, I started writing it because I couldn't write an essay book because I was having too much depression. Hmm. And so I thought, oh, this will be easier. And then turns out it was not easier. And so <laughs> now I've gone back to it. Um, but I will say the thing that was very helpful for me on writing my books. Yeah. Um, so I really struggled with how do I, um, how do I get things done? Because I'm a very slow writer and it felt like it was so slow. It felt like, why am I even doing this? And so sometimes I would just feel like I'm not going to do it anymore. And I stop yeah. writing for a month. Um, so what I did is every single chapter that I had, I just had like a little post-it that was tacked to the wall and I just had like the name of the chapter and every say, and I just started with everything was at 0% finished. And every day at the end of the day, I would be like, okay, well, I took this one from, you know, this one was 52%. I worked on it a little bit. I'm going to say it's 53% done. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a slow process, but seeing it actually change and seeing like, oh, okay, this one's finally at hundred percent. Wow. People don't take five years to write their books. Um, so you're probably a lot faster. How long did it take you to, to write? This. Um, this it was a year and a half from yeah a year and a half but wow. I love the idea I love the idea of being able to see a visual kind of r reminder of hey you're making progress because I do think you know sometimes just being in the trenches and I actually I did feel it with this book I'd feel like oh my god it's never gonna end like I, I or or I'd read a draft that I thought was like almost done and then I'd be like yeah, it's not like it's gonna take a lot more work baby um and that's always a terrifying reality <laughs> so but well, to see, it. yeah yeah 
Oh, shit. The, the first time that you, that you share, um, your, your ideas and your thoughts. I, I mean, it, I always find it, uh, intensely terrifying, even, you know, many books on, I still, every time I send one to my agent and I'm like, what about this? And then I just hide in a corner and I'm like, I hate myself and everyone hates me. What's going to happen? No one's going to like me. Um, did you have that same, that same sort of fear? The first draft, I mean, my first drafts are ungodly. Like these things are horrifying and knowing like, and I know that, but I also, I have to get them out. Like, because I don't outline my first draft is kind of like a suggestion of what it's going to eventually become. And then I do a lot of drafting and revisions, but I call it like the vomit first draft. And, and it really just is that for me where I don't allow any judgment and I just let it come out because I am very familiar with the judgmental part of my brain. And I let that kind of come in when I'm doing the revisions. But for the first draft, if I let my judgmental brain in, I would literally never get anything written. It would just never happen. It'd just be crippling. Um, so it's all creativity, all free flowing the first draft. And then I send it to people and I very much immediately after I click send, I'm like, my whole body just wants to suck into itself and <laughs> evaporate. Um, and I remember particularly like the way that it ended was so different from how it is now. <laughs> It was so bad and I'm still right now cringing that anyone read it and I'm sure they had a sidebar conversation about like it's gonna get there like a very high-pitched conversation of how it was gonna get there and people trying to just encourage each other I'm sure I wasn't on that conversation but I'm grateful they trusted me for the for the many drafts that came after it I, I submitted something recently because I couldn't get the novel finished and I was like I'm just gonna write something else mm -hmm. um because then maybe they won't sue me for not turning in the novel. And so I was like, I was like, I'll just write this other, I've got this other idea for a book. And so I wrote it and, um, and I sent it to my agent and she was like, okay, I like the idea of this book, but it's nuts. Um, but I love this, but you got to take all this out, but this is great. <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, that's what I need. I need somebody to be like, okay, you're moving in the right direction. Yeah. And then you went crazy. Let's bring it back in here. I love you, but also you're killing me. <laughs> it works. It what's, works. What's the what's the plan with the novel? Are you feeling like are you wanting to explore it in the future? Are you thinking for now it's a no? Is it are you curious about? Are you feeling the itch at all? I think um I think I worked on it in my head too much. And so for me, it's so old. And it's so, and I've, I've rewritten it so many times. And because I have memory problems, I look at all the different versions and I'm like, which one was the right one? Which one did I like? What oh. really happened? Yes. And so, yeah. Whereas with essays, I can just be like, well, I'm just going to start a brand new one right here. Let's just say this is a chapter. Yeah. Um, I think that I will eventually write it. I think what I'm going to do is, um, because I have such a, a bad, uh, a bad idea about my own writing. Like I don't like it. And so, um, because I don't like it, I tend to delete everything that I write. And so I think what I'm going to do is just be like, okay, well, if I was going to write a story for my grandkids, if I ever write them so that they could just pull out a book and go, oh, grandma wrote this like ghost story, you know, once. Um, and if I just write it for them, then really I'm kind of writing it for myself. And I think I'll be more likely to finish it. Are, are you saying you don't like the process of writing or you or when you look at your words if that's what you don't like I don't like my words yeah what happened what what's what's going on in your mind when you what happens uh because I look at it and I'm like oh this should be first person oh no this should be third person oh no this should be oh I need to do this chronologically wait no I need to do a flashback here no I need to and I get mm -hmm. so caught up with the whole story that I can't focus on just the beginning or or I'll get really fun and I'll be like, oh, I wrote three great chapters and I'll turn them in and they'll be like, this is great. None of this should go in the book. Uh, you should start from at the very end. And I'm like, but I worked for a year on these three chapters. And they're like, well, and that's great work for you to know this was the backstory. The people are not, people are not gonna, you need to start where the action is. I'm like. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I hope to, I hope to see the novel. I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll send you pieces. So I would, I would truly love that. Oh my goodness. All right. Maybe it'll, it'll, it'll give me a reason to, yes, to so move please, please, forward. Please, please send it. Um, awesome. Well, we have taken up all of your time and this was so much fun. 
I absolutely adore you. This is, this was the best uh, conversation that I've had in weeks. Actually, it's it's one of the only ones that I've had with people who <laughs> are in my family, but it's still, it's still wonderful and I love it. And I'm so glad that I got to, to meet you in person and not just in my head on the book. Same to you. I've been looking forward to this for weeks and, um, and, it, and it exceeded my already very high expectations. And I, I can't wait to read your, read your novel. And, um, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate talking with you. Of course. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, for here. In. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope, uh, hope, you, hope you like meat and breadstick. <laughs> right? Oh, my God. I love breadstick. The best. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>